Now, um, I'm going to talk about uh, the King, just some uh, aspects of the King in the early Irish law texts. Uh, so, first of all, I'll have a few introductory remarks about the law texts or the Brahan laws. So, an extensive body of law texts, uh, which in the words of a leading authority on the subject, represent one of the greatest achievements of the Irish in the early Middle Ages, uh, has survived from medieval Ireland. They are often referred to as Brehon laws, uh, from the Irish word for judge, which is brehav, uh, plural brehun. Um, these texts can be distinguished according to language, whether they're written in Latin or Irish, uh, their date and their nature. Um, and the earliest Irish texts date from the late seventh century. So these go back a very long way uh, in time. And from then on, we have a continuous stream of legal writings in Old Irish, which is the period from six, circa 600 to 900 AD, Middle Irish, circa 900 to 1200, so both of those combined are the pre-Norman period, and then Early Modern Irish uh, from circa 1200 to circa 1650, when the last vestiges of the Brehan law system uh, uh, disappear. So, and a crucial distinction then is between law books and legislation. Um, most of the surviving texts in the vernacular are best described as law books. Uh, that is, they are texts uh, concerned with explaining what the law is. Um, they are not, we do have some texts of actual legislation, but the survival rate for these is lower. Now, one of the advantages of these, the, the nature of these texts is, of course, that the, uh, the, the law texts are not simply legislation of the fine for uh, stealing a pig is so much than the fine, your know, long lists of tariffs of fines and so on. They're actually quite discursive uh, texts and they cast a great deal of uh, very important light on the structure of early Irish society and social in um, uh, institutions and practices. So uh, the early medieval law texts have quite a lot to say about kings and here I will have time to look at just a few of the main issues discussed in them. Uh, I'll be drawn mainly, but not exclusively, on one of the most important uh, texts, that is the Shadach uh, composed in Armagh in the late 7th century. This is the most important one because it's the most extensive in its coverage of uh, uh, legal aspects, and it is also regarded, uh, it is cited then in later legal writings as uh, a major authority. So the three aspects that I want to look at are the, uh, what the law texts have to say about various levels of king, uh, the second is the position of the king in relation to others in society. And the third issue is what is expected of the king, uh, what the law texts have to say about what uh, the, the behavior of the, uh, the king. So uh, I'll begin then with a brief look at the various levels of king. Uh, in a number of related Middle Irish texts, six levels of kingship are uh, distinguished. And the lowest level is the king of a single tuath, uh, which is a petty kingdom. Uh, it's the smallest political unit, and this would be uh, smaller than a county, perhaps roughly equivalent to a mod modern uh, barony. Uh, and then you have a king of uh, uh, more than one tuath, a king of several tuath. Uh, the next important one is the king of a province. And in the, uh, these are texts from the uh, 11th and 12th century, uh, they then, above the king of a province, of course, Dermot McMurrah would be, uh, belong to this category, number four. Uh, we have the king of Ireland with opposition and the king of Ireland without opposition, who is the highest uh, uh, ranking king. And another um, um, uh, text from this period, 11th to 12th century, uh, gives us a useful definition of the, uh, what it means to be the King of Ireland without opposition. It says that uh, when uh, he's the King of Ireland without opposition when the estuaries are under him, that is Dublin and Waterford and Limerick. Uh, in other words, the unopposed King of Ireland must have control not only over the Irish, but also over the, uh, all the Scandinavian settlements in, uh, in Ireland. Right. Uh, these, so these, as I said, sources can be dated roughly to the 11th or 12th centuries. And while all scholars are agreed that the concept, concept of a King of Ireland was recognised in this period, what is at issue is whether the early law texts of the 7th to 8th centuries uh, admitted of a, any rank of king higher than the king of a province. The highest grade of king in the Shanachas Mor, which as I've said is late 7th century, 
uh, produced in Armagh was titled Ri Rodach, or King of Great Kings. And regarding this figure, he was higher than, we can be certain that he was higher than a provincial king. Secondly, that the Shanachas Mór treats Ireland as a political unit. Uh, but third, the third point is the degree to which the concept of a king of the whole of Ireland uh, was realised at this uh, early stage is still the subject of scholarly debate. Now, the second uh, issue in the law tracks is the, the position of the king in relation to others. Right? In, so in the Shanachas Mór, the king is, uh, is presented as being at the apex of society, uh, but he's not alone there. Um, uh, he shares this position, the highest level of society, with others, and the same status is uh, assigned not only to the king, but also to the bishop. Now, these are both uh, the, what they have in common, of course, is that they're lay and ecclesiastical rulers, uh, but also then to the highest ranking uh, learned men, uh, whether they are Latin scholars or scholars in the vernacular, the phile. Um, so while we have here uh, an indication of high regard for learning, uh, nevertheless, in such cases, the king in question is the lowest level of king, the king of a single tooth, um, uh, the, the, the smallest political unit. Um, uh, similar statements are found in other early law tra tracts, um, uh, and one uh, gives a very neat definition of the, uh, what the petty the tooth or the petty kingdom is. Uh, a kingdom without a Latin scholar, without a churchman, without a poet, without a king by whom contracts and treaties are extended to other kingdoms is no kingdom. So uh, this is a useful definition of a kingdom. You have to have a king at the head of, a ki uh, of the kingdom, but you need other people who are uh, at the same level, at the apex of society, along with the king. Uh, the idea then that the king is above or beyond the law recurs a number of times in the Shanachas Mór. Um, and uh, for example, um, um, uh, it says in the, the process known as distraint, uh, which is you know, taking the, uh, the property of another person and uh, removing it as a, me as a means of redress. Um, uh, there are places where, where you cannot take distrained cattle. And the interesting thing here in this list of uh, places is that the king and uh, the ecclesiastic or churchman appear beside a person who's clearly beyond the law, the thief, and another who is deemed untouchable for fear of his satire. And the fact that these are associated in a, in a list is indicated that they are beyond or um, uh, above the law in different ways, of course, but at the same time, they are uh, seen as, in a way, beyond the law. Um, another text expresses the idea in different terms. You're not to extract a promise from a king or a poet or an ecclesiastic, for each one is too high in status and, and uh, impossible to get satisfaction from. Um, and another text uh, talks about the ultimate king of every individual. It's the term it uses for the provincial king. Uh, he is uncoercible by anyone else. Right? You, can, uh, you have no sanctions that you can use against him. Um, as Fergus, Fergus Kelly in his um, um, uh, essential, uh, indispensable guide to earlier Irish law noted, the obvious difficulties of imposing law observance on the most important and powerful man in the kingdom are recognised in the law tracks. One solution was the appointment of a uh, so-called athachfortha, or a substitute commoner, uh, who would stand in for the king. So instead of uh, uh, taking legal action against the king, you would uh, take uh, legal action against this um, uh, substitute uh, for the uh, for the king. Now, uh, again, this uh, class of person is most likely to be at the level of the the lowest the lowest grade of king, the reed tuatha, um, the king of a single tuath. Now, uh, the third issue, which is uh, uh, covered in the uh, law tracks, is uh, uh, expectations of the uh, of the king. Uh, the law, as, as again, as Fergus Kelly remarked, the authors of the law text seem to expect the king to observe the law like other members of the kingdom. And the Shanachas Mór devotes a good deal of attention to how a king must maintain his status uh, as well as how he can lose it. Right. So uh, in one passage, the Shanachas Mór is again linked with these other uh, high-ranking persons that I mentioned before. Uh, there are four eminences of a kingdom who utterly debase themselves into insignificance. Uh, a falsely judging king, so a king who passes 
false judgments. Um, Epscob Tushlidach, a stumbling bishop, and you can fill that in yourself. Um, a, a fraudulent poet, um, uh, an unworthy noble. And it goes on to say that righteousness is expected from every uh, king. Uh, elsewhere, the Shanachas Moor uh, links the attributes of royal power with the consequences of unworthy conduct. Um, so it says in, in translation, he is no king who does not have hostages in fetters, to whom no sovereign's tribute is given, uh, to whom are not paid the profits of justice. So he, is, he has uh, an organized legal system in which fines are extracted from wrongdoers and the king, the legal system, receives a, a share in these uh, fines, that is, the profits of justice. When the king assumes these functions, it is then that he is uh, uh, compensated as a king uh, who is without falsehood, without betrayal, without unworthiness towards the members of his kingdom. And it goes on to say, there are seven witnesses which attest to the falsehood of every king, turning a synod out of their precinct without right or due cause, uh, that is, uh, not treating the church with its uh, with due respect, being the object of satire unless it be uh, 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 unjustified, um, is being defeated in battle. Famine during his reign, dryness of milch cows, destruction of mast, scarcity of corn. Uh, in other words, the usual one, blame the, um, if the weather is bad, you blame the government. Uh, it's a, a, a variation of this. Um, uh, lack of prosperity is seen as a direct consequence of the, uh, the badness of the, the ruler. And it goes on then to say, these are the seven bright candles which reveal the falsehood of every king. The idea also then of a king being uh, physically perfect is, uh, appears quite a lot in the saga literature, but also turns up in the law text. Um, in Shanachas Moor, it speaks about, about, when talking about bees, um, which are uh, discussed in the Shanachas Moor, uh, the consequences of uh, uh, setting up hives of bees on your land and how this will affect your neighbors. Uh, this, by the way, gives you an indication of how detailed this, uh, this law tract is. It covers uh, everything right down to uh, bees. Um, so uh, this is the first judgment which is passed with regard to the offenses of bees. It was on Conchal, uh, the Kaich, or the one-eyed, whom bees blinded in one eye. He was king of Tara until this put him from his kingship. So the fact that he was blemished uh, by a bee sting in the eye um, um, uh, disqualified him from the kingship. A king can also fail through uh, loss of material resources or physical strength. Again, as the Shanach Hasmar states, there are three things which result in the loss of sovereignty for anyone. Failure of his material and moral qualifications, decay of tribute from clients, failure of his strength. Um, and another passage in the Shanach Asmar lists still further ways in which a king can forfeit his status. A king who refuses hospitality to every person. A king who eats what has been stolen and plundered. Uh, a king who besmirches his honor. A king who endures satire. Um, in all of this, of course, satire here is used in a, in a loose sense. This is a form of public uh, uh, condemnation of a person. And enduring satire means that uh, you are accepting that what is said in it is true, and that, uh, you don't contest it. Um, so it's a public condemnation of the, uh, of, the, of, of the king. And then a king who is defeated in battle, again, and a king who slays a member of his own king, kin, his own kindred, his own relatives, which uh, when you look at the annals, of course, um, uh, one of the uh, usual methods of uh, gaining king kingship is to bump off all your rivals, right? So uh, this is slightly difficult to uh, uh, reconcile. Um, now, a primary function then of the king is, as, as, as has come up in, uh, in, from these citations, is to rule justly and to represent his people in their dealings with others. And uh, one uh, eighth century text, the Kreeth Govloch, has a very detailed account of a contractual relationship between king and people. And in this, the people are, are said to ordain the king and it sets out then not only the royal rights, but also royal obligations. Um, the royal rights to make a, certain exactions from his, uh, from his kingdom to, um, uh, when he's military campaigns and so on, to raise um, um, 
uh, soldiers, etc. But also then his obligations, such as providing a, a, a just judge and being wholly impartial and just as between the weak and the uh, uh, strong. The problem, of course, in the law tracks, and we have a lot more than just what I've cited here today on the uh, what is expected of the king, the, uh, the king's um, um, uh, obligations. The problem is, of course, what happens when the king does not live up to these uh, uh, expectations. And uh, going by our present state of knowledge, it appears that under early Irish law, it would be highly unlikely that a king would be put on trial. Um, and certainly, um, even if you were to consider the possibility of such a thing happening, the more likely uh, the, the most likely scenario in which this might happen would be the lower levels of kings, the king of a single tooth. Uh, it is very difficult to imagine this uh, happening with the king of a province or somebody even higher than that. Um, and as I've mentioned already, the, the, according to the old Irish uh, text, Chris Govlach, 8th century text, a king cannot be controlled or coerced by anyone else. And at the same time, high standards of conduct are expected of the king, as we have seen. The ultimate sanction seems to have been either a revolt by his, um, uh, his, his subordinates, right? and very often this could, be, could have been uh, preceded, at least in, um, uh, in saga or literary representations of what happens to an unjust king, it's very often preceded by a formal condemnation or denunciation, public denunciation of the king by a poet, and uh, then the king is... Uh, is uh, uh, removed by his uh, his subordinates, or the the other the alternative then is the intervention of a more powerful external ruler, uh, and these would usually result in uh, in either death or banishment. And of course, many such instances are uh, recorded in the annals. In the case of Dermot MacMurra, uh, he submitted to Rudy or in 1167 and was forced to pay 100 ounces of gold in uh, compensation to Tiernan O'Rourke. Uh, while it is likely that jurists would have been involved uh, in calculating the compensation, it is not certain that the process would have involved a formal trial.